I'm Andal Balu from Kokotown. Welcome you all uh, for joining us for this webinar on tempering. And we are glad that Amy Coronado accepted to give the topic. And she came up with a very cool topic. It's called Temperamental, the science and tips to do the good tempering. And before that, we just want to give you a brief introduction to Coco Town. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction to Coco Town. Uh, we started the parent company in 1992 and we called it Inno Concepts because when we started the business, we didn't want to sell any Me Too product. And also we had a couple of uh, uh, restrictions because I had, uh, I wanted to stay home and uh, raise kids. So I wanted to be a home-based business but at the same time, no geographical bounds, boundaries. And in addition to that, we wanted to do like innovative uh, concepts. That's why we called it as Inno Concepts. Even before we started selling, because first we formed the company, then we looked for the products, what we want to sell. Then we looked at some of the innovative, uh, you know, uh, grinding machines that people uh, came up in India and that was needed for our South Indian cooking. We said, okay, uh, let's start uh, selling this. So it took us about two years to convince the manufacturer that we can sell their product and we can be that you know, um, single distributor. So we started focusing on the idli dosa grinding machines for the South Indian food. And then um, it was going good. The business was good. We had uh, 10 or 12 distributors or the dealers around the country. So they sold the machines and also they gave the service. So people didn't have to ship the machine each way for simple you know, repairs because those days internet was not that popular in 1992 when we started. And then in 2007, 2008, unfortunately the recession hit years and the business was stagnant. We had a warehouse full of stuff. We didn't know what to do. Then we wanted to pivot to stay uh, floating in the business. So we wanted to switch our focus to an industry where we can make a difference. We, whenever people buy our machines that we were selling for making the idli dosa grinder, if I see a name uh, that's not Indian, South Indian name, I call them and ask them, hey, what are you using it for? Because this is a South Indian machine. And those days, all this food is also not that popular. Now you can go to any city, you can get all the international food. And in the early 1990s and to, you know, uh, people were not familiar with a lot of other food unless they had traveled there and tasted it personally. So we made a note of all the things people were using the machines for. And then we found out there were like a five or six people who bought the machines. They said they are using for chocolate. That picked our interest. Chocolate, because we saw that people were making for masa, for the Mexican corn tortillas, the Filipino food that lady was making to serve on, it's called um, uh, Puto. They served on the Filipino airlines, things like that. And then chocolate, how can you make with this grinder? And then we talked to people and asked them what they are doing, how they are using. They said, well, for chocolate, you have to grind the cocoa nibs for three days. And we had to do the modification. So they had to be the MacGyvers in addition to being a chocolate maker. So uh, Dr. Balu, he has a, a PhD in chemistry. I have a master's in botany. But Balu said, okay, uh, I will be the MacGyver and make all the modifications for you so you can focus on the craft that you are good at. So just be the chocolate maker. Otherwise, the field of entry for chocolate was limited because they had to be the engineers. They had to, you know, how to, to you know, tinker the machine. And then also they need to make the chocolate. So then we started, uh, uh, you know, selling machines for the purpose of chocolate. And we, in 2009, we formed the company uh, Cocoa Town, especially for focusing on the cocoa as a superfood. And also we found out that when we people make the chocolate in small batches, the farmers get ben more benefit because otherwise people were, uh, and all the cocoa farmers were selling the cocoa as a commodity prices to the big companies but when the small chocolate makers or the bean to bar chocolate makers came in they wanted to have the direct relationship with the farmers because they wanted to know the source of the food all the way through the supply chain and they were educating farmers to ferment it right 
and they were giving them two to three times more money than what the commodity price was. So it was uh, helping the cocoa farmers also because we always believe in farming because if the cocoa farm, you know, we have a saying, if the cocoa farmer doesn't set his foot in the mud, we don't have the food on our table. So, but at the same time, if you look all over the world, the farmers are not compensated, you know, very highly. They are the least, uh, you know, um, earning members of the supply chain. So this one, you know, the bean to bar movement is changing that paradigm. And some of the uh, cocoa farmers are moving up the economic value chain. And this is just a brief history of um, Cocoa Town through the years. So in 1994, you know, we started selling because I, like I told you, it took two years to convince the manufacturer to supply us the machines and make the changes we needed for uh, working uh, for that to work in US. Because just taking from India and selling here was not uh, easy. Because there are a lot of changes had to be made because of the electricity variation, this, you know, all the other things. And then in 2007, we started uh, selling the commercial grinders for the chocolate. And then we also have the patents for our machines. And in 2020, again, we had to pivot because of the worldwide pandemic. At least in 2007, only US and Western countries had a problem. The rest of the world was okay. But now, all over the world, the economy is stagnant. So we looked at it and we wanted to help our customers who are going through the same thing like us. You know, the less sales, but they don't know what to do. So we wanted to give them the hope and also the time to learn more things about chocolate so they can be uh, <clears throat> they can sustain the business and do the business better. So that's when we talked to different uh, you know, uh, experts and they all agreed to give the webinar free of charge. So in turn, our customers can learn free, not our customers and any participant because we don't restrict it's only for Cocoa Town customers. Anybody can join and we just want to do as the education uh, for the uh, the whole world. And then, uh, so then in 2020, our new objectives are to empower the uh, chocopreneurs we call because they are the entrepreneurs in the chocolate industry and then the cocoa farmers. Through education, equipment, we also now have the evaluation tools like a bean cutter. And now we are working on creating an online cocoa city to provide the resources in one place because it's a fledgling uh, industry. There are some resources on the internet, but it's not there all in one place. So we are trying to see how we can have the source for people to know everything about chocolate. And also we are working on developing new line of machines and accessories. So. What is the future? Yeah, we are looking for normal life now that the vaccination is here. So we hope we can see everybody face to face. One thing, you know, the pandemic, you know, brought all of us together. Like for this webinar today, people from, um, I think 41 countries have registered. So it would not have been possible in the other days. Yes, we could travel and meet people in person, but it was a limited interaction. Now we are interacting more, but still we miss the physical interaction. So we want to have the best of the both worlds. And then we will continue to have the virtual connections. And then I want to end with Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu. That means may all the beings everywhere in the universe be happy and free. And may the thoughts, words, and actions of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. Thank you. Now I hand over the mic to Teresa. Hi there. So welcome to our Empowering Chocopreneurs webinar. Uh, I will just do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, I'm Teresa with Cocoa Town. And uh, so a little bit of housekeeping for the webinar today. Uh, what we would ask is if that you'll please put your questions in the chat and we will do our best to, um, to uh, interrupt Amy uh, when the questions come in at a, at a at the right time to get your questions answered in real time. Uh, we ask you to put them in the chat because what we would like to do is um, we're gonna have Amy answer those questions and, and um, we'll put them up at a later date on our website so that you can revisit the question and answer. So rather than raise your hand, if you'll put your questions in the chat, that will help us with that. 
And just so everyone knows, we will we are recording the event and we will be sending that out to you a link at a later date so that you can watch uh, watch the recorded event. So with housekeeping done, what I would like to do is just take just take a few moments to talk to Amy and find out a little bit about her. And so what I would like to do is ask her a couple of questions. So Amy, um, if you're ready, I would like to ask you if you could just take a moment and tell us about how you got into chocolate. Yeah, so um, my background is in material science and engineering. And so I know a lot about the science of different materials. And uh, I was just, when I was looking for a job after graduation, I was scrolling Twitter one day and I saw a video of uh, Cocoa Press, which is the company I currently work for, um, 3D printing chocolate. And I just thought it was awesome. And so um, I reached out, ended up uh, getting hired on with Cocoa Press and, um, over the summer preceding starting, um, I met uh, a chocolatier who um, just was someone's grandmother of uh, a friend and explained a lot of the basics of chocolate to me and it was fascinating. And then when I started at Cocoa Press, I made a point to uh, spend a lot of time researching chocolate as a material and really understanding all of the science behind it. Uh, so that's how I got started. And uh, you know, since starting at Cocoa Press, I've tempered I don't even know how many batches of chocolate. Uh, usually we do smaller batches for uh, research and development purposes, but um, I would say at this point, I have a good amount of both um, theoretical and real life experience with chocolate. Wow, that's great. I was gonna ask you uh, if you could share something interesting about your chocolate journey, but that you kind of answered that question within the body of the previous question, but is there any, <laughs> Any one interesting thing other than what you've already shared um, that you'd like to share with, with our attendees in relation to your chocolate journey or, or, or your life in general? Yeah, I guess um, I never really th thought about um, food so much as a material, you know, material science, the kind of bread and butter of it is uh, metals like steel making and um, there's also like ceramics and stuff, but the behavior of chocolate, as you'll see from some stuff in my talk is, um, really scientific and really similar to the behavior of some things like plastics, um, and the way plastics crystallize. And so, um, that really surprised me. And I think it's, uh, there's a lot of chocolatiers who have a lot of, uh, knowledge of how it feels in their hands and, uh, kind of experimental. They figured it out as they went. Um, and I guess the thing that's been really exciting for me is bringing together the science and the experiential. Great, I love that. All right, well, with, with that, I will turn the um, event over to you and let you tell us about tempering chocolate. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, I'm excited. All right, let's get this started. Okay. So as you, as uh, was mentioned earlier, my presentation is called Temperamental, a guide to the science and craft of chocolate tempering. Uh, I'm Amy Coronado. I'm senior chocolate engineer at Cocoa Press. And uh, the pictures you see on the left are just uh, kind of a, a fun shape geometric representation of crystallization and uh, just as a lot of you probably know, what bloom chocolate looks like versus well-tempered chocolate. So a little bit about me. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science in Material Science and Engineering from Carnegie Mellon University, and I minored in additive manufacturing, which is just fancy for 3D printing. Uh, I am currently the senior chocolate engineer at Cocoa Press. I'm the staff expert in tempering, printing, chocolate formulation, and materials. So a little bit about Cocoa Press. Uh, we design 3D printers that print chocolate. Uh, they can be des they're designed for use with any chocolate and specifically cocoa butter based chocolates, uh, but they can be also used with compound chocolates. We are currently selling customized chocolates, which I'll get into a little bit later, but that's kind of a fun way to uh, experience a, a printed chocolate if you would like to. So um, on the left, you can see uh, this photo here is with uh, myself, our founder, Evan Weinstein, and uh, one of our co-op students, Will. 
Um, this is a render of the printer before we had it in real life. You'll see pictures of it later. Um, and then this is a photo of it printing. You can see all the different layers of the chocolate and you can see that the temper is preserved. So that's really cool. So uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today, first of all, what is chocolate? Uh, second of all, cocoa butter crystals, which are really, really important. Um, tempering, kind of the process and how that goes. Bloom, what that looks like and how you can prevent it. Um, other things that can go wrong in the tempering process, uh, putting it all back together and some extra tips, tricks, and some fun stuff. So first of all, the basics, what is chocolate? So all chocolate has sugar, uh, fatty cocoa solids, which is cocoa butter, and uh, lectin. There's usually soy lectin or sunflower lectin. Uh, that's basically to help hold all of the ingredients together. It's uh, what's known as an emulsifier. Um, that's not super important for the structure of chocolate. It's just something kind of to know if you look on the uh, ingredients in chocolate, you'll usually see that. Then um, dark chocolate and milk chocolate both have non-fatty cocoa solids, which give chocolate that distinctive brown color. Uh, they've got smell molecules. If you've heard of theobromine, which is the stuff that's poisonous to dogs, uh, that is also in non-fatty cocoa solids. Um, then in white chocolate, and milk chocolate, there's dairy fats. So the milk powder or the cream powder is what makes the difference between milk chocolate and dark chocolate. Um, there's also compound chocolate, which is a chocolate that instead of having cocoa butter, these fatty cocoa solids has some other type of fat. Um, as you'll see in the rest of the presentation, the cocoa fat, the cocoa butter is what makes it so difficult to temper chocolate. So it's really useful for big companies like Hershey or Mars to use compound chocolate instead because it's easier to process. Um, some interesting terminology to know is cocoa solids, also known as chocolate liqueur, um, include both the fatty and the non-fatty cocoa solids. So both the stuff that makes it brown and the stuff that uh, is in cocoa butter. And actually it's really interesting when you grind up the beans, usually you run them through a machine that has a, a screw, like a really big uh, screw that pushes the cocoa butter out of all these holes in a, in a thing that the screw goes into. And then the um, non-fatty cocoa solids come out the end and that's kind of it's like cocoa powder, but even cocoa powder is 10 to 20% cocoa fat. Um, also, percent cacao, you may see this on um, bags of chocolate that you get, or uh, it's, it's part of some of the labeling requirements. That's percentage of cocoa mass, including any added cocoa butter. So if you make something direct from the bean and then add extra cocoa butter, you have to add in that percentage to get your percent cacao. What's really important here is the fatty cocoa solids, the cocoa butter, because that leads to this really complex behavior that we know is tempering. So cocoa butter crystals. Cocoa butter crystals are what we have to control during the process of tempering. So cocoa butter is made of uh, these triglycerides, they're called, and they've got these three different kinds of acids. It's That's acid one, palmitic acid, stearic acid, oleic acid. There are some others in really small percentages inside uh, cocoa butter, but these are the main three that are the most important. And here it kind of looks like a three-pronged fork, but what it actually looks like is this two-pronged fork with a handle. And these triglyceride molecules stack kind of like that, and then they stack into these, they're called lamellae, which this is just a fancy word that means layers. And then these layers stack into these kind of platelets. And the platelets build up into these things, they're called spherulites, because this is just a cross section, it's a cut from the side of what it looks like, but um, they grow into these big spiky balls and they're kind of spherical, which is why they're called spherulites. And all of that is in the bulk cocoa butter fat. So I bet you're kind of wondering, I'm talking a lot about crystals. And a lot of you probably, when you think crystals, you think you know things that go on rings, little shiny baubles, but uh, crystals are just more organized arrangements of any molecule. Uh, there are crystals in plastics, there are crystals in metals, um, and there are crystals in chocolate. So uh, one thing about chocolate is even though it's having this cool crystallization behavior, you can't see it because you can't see through the chocolate. But this is sodium acetate. And sodium acetate is uh, just a compound that you can have a ton of in water and then you drop a seed crystal in, which is what you do in seeded tempering, and it causes that crystal growth to start. So I'm going to show you uh, this 
kind of crystal growth is what's happening in chocolate. You just can't see it. So here you'll see there is a, this is a solution of water and sodium acetate. And then they're gonna drop in a seed crystal. You'll see it in just a second. And that seed crystal is gonna cause rapid growth of a crystal. And there. So you see that crystal start to grow and spread out. And it's just crystallizing sodium acetate. It's still in the water. It's still got water in it. But because the crystal is opaque, not see-through, and the water is, you can really clearly see the growth of the crystal. So here's another video that shows that more from like a side view. And on the left is a solution with less sodium acetate and on the right is one with more. So in the, the one with less, you can see more of the spikes of the crystal. So that's the seed crystal that just got dropped in and it's causing this growth of this crystal. And it's a spherolite, like I was talking about, it's spherical, it's this kind of spiky ball. And this one is more spiky than ball and this one's more ball than spiky, but they're both spiky balls of crystal that grow out like that. And if you can imagine a chocolate, rather than one seed crystal you're dropping in, your, you have tons of little seed crystals that are all growing until they're touching each other and you get all of these little spherolites. So that is what just general crystallization looks like. And this is what a cocoa fat crystal really looks like. So this is cocoa fat. Uh, this is the triglyceride that I was talking about earlier. And um, you can see that this, this little bar right here, uh, this is 100 microns, and this is about the width of a human hair. So this is a, a really small, but not so small that uh, it's impossible to kind of imagine the size. And uh, now that we know what a general cocoa butter crystal looks like, uh, I wanna break it down because there's more than one type of cocoa butter crystal. In fact, there's six. And uh, some of you may have heard this before. This is kind of just a, um, this isn't what the crystals really look like. Uh, this is just kind of a useful way of visualizing. So when chocolate is melted, it kind of has no shape to it. It doesn't have any crystal structure. Uh, then there are different ways that these, this kind of melted formless triglycerides can form into different crystal types. And uh, these is kind of a description of the different crystal types. And you can see they're more stable as you get up into the higher crystal types. Gamma one is the first one that forms if you shock chocolate, like if you um, cool it down really, really fast by mixing it over an ice bath or something like that. Um, it's really soft and crumbly. It blooms a lot and it melts right when you touch it. Uh, alpha two is soft and crumbly with no snap. Um, so it's a little bit more stable. It still melts on the touch. There's still some bloom. Uh, beta three, it's firm. It has no snap. So um, a little bit more stable, still melts on touch, uh, still has some bloom. Beta four is firm and it has a good snap. Um, it's formed by allowing melted chocolate to cool at room temperature. So if you're working with chocolate, you completely melt it and then you just drop some on the table and let it cool. Uh, beta four is the type of crystal that will form and you don't want that because it's firm, but it doesn't have the good snap and it still blooms, it won't stay shiny. Um, and also it won't come out of your molds as easily. So if you've been molding something before and it really sticks to your mold and you have to kind of like pry it off, uh, it's probably because it has a lot of beta-4 crystals. Uh, beta-5 is the one you want. Beta-5 is uh, the beautiful, shiny, stable chocolate that won't melt uh, right when you touch it, and it won't bloom, and it's got that really good kind of popping snap that you want. Um, and it's also really smoothly textured in your mouth. All of these other ones, as they bloom, um, and even before they bloom, when you put them in your mouth, they just don't feel the same kind of silky that you want your chocolate to feel. Um, for hard, or, sorry, and then type six, type six actually can't be formed from melted chocolate. It only happens when you've got uh, chocolate that you have sitting on a shelf for 16 plus weeks. And it just slowly transitions over time into this like crumbly, uh, very much bloomed, chalky looking uh, chocolate that is a little bit more difficult to melt. So a little bit of notes on these naming conventions. Uh, in short, they are confusing. So I'm gonna try to make them a little bit less confusing. Uh, 
this table just kind of shows how much they've changed over time. So in 1951, when some people were doing uh, not the first research on chocolate, but some of the best early published research on chocolate, they thought there were only four crystal types. So they named them gamma, alpha, beta double prime, and beta. And uh, don't ask me why they named this one beta double prime and this one just beta. That's uh, confusing to me too. Then the next time someone researched chocolate and published, uh, it's the same guy actually, um, or person, they changed it from beta double prime to beta prime, which makes more sense. Uh, then in 1964, they said, oh wait, there's a fifth crystal type. We're gonna call that, uh, we're gonna call the three beta double prime, beta prime, and beta. Then in 1966, they said, actually there's a sixth crystal type. So we're just gonna call them one through six. And that went on for a little while until uh, 1976 when uh, this person just said, you know what, I'm gonna call, uh, what they were calling crystal type one, crystal type six, and then just completely reverse it. So for our purposes, uh, to keep things kind of consistent, we're gonna do a combination naming system. So gamma, and I'll, I'll have things reminding you because I know that Greek letters can be confusing. Uh, gamma is type one, and that's gonna be gamma one. And this, this second part is gamma relating to the Greek letter naming system and the one relating to this kind of Roman numeral naming system so that when you look at this, you can see both what it is in the Greek letters and what it is in the number. So then alpha is type two, alpha two, beta prime is type three and four. So uh, as, as you can see, it kind of breaks down interestingly here. Um, beta three is gonna be type three and beta four is gonna be type four. And then beta is type five and six. So beta five, this is the one you really want. Beta five is type five and beta six is type six. So uh, I bet you're wondering what makes one crystal type, uh, type one, type two uh, versus type three, type four, or type five. Um, so it's the arrangement of those kind of tuning fork triglyceride fat molecules we were talking about earlier. So type two, uh, it's basically how tightly they pack. So the tighter packed in those molecules are, the more stable they are, the less likely they are to bloom. So type two, as you can see, it forms these little like parallelograms. And uh, if you think about it, no matter how many of these you pack in rows like this, you're always gonna have this little bit of empty space right here at the end of a row. So that means it's not as tightly packed as say one that's tilted a little bit and has a smaller little area of space here. So type two is less stable than types three and four, which is less stable than types five and six, which type five and six is tilted. So there's no extra space at the end of a row and they're really tightly packed. Uh, and how these crystal types are formed. So this is what's called a phase diagram. Um, it just shows you in time and temperature space how to create these different forms of crystals and where they're stable. So uh, this is temperature, this is time, this is on a logarithmic scale, which just means that like uh, it's not linear. So if you're looking at it, like the space between one and uh, 10 is different than if you were to divide it. Like if you were to put 10 little marks right here, uh, this would not be equal to, like each of those steps would not be equal to one. This is one, uh, and then this step is a little bit more and more and more until you get to 10. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, also, this is to do with static cocoa butter. So something that's really important when you're tempering is to be mixing because that makes this process happen faster. Uh, the reason you see time scales out to like 10,000 minutes on this graph is because they're just letting the cocoa butter sit. And because you're not mixing it, you're not introducing the extra energy that allows this to happen faster. So let's think about these. These lines are uh, basically the heat processing that you're going through. So imagine that you're starting with your chocolate melted uh, to make type one, which is uh, beta one, that really unstable crystal that you can make by shock tempering your chocolate. You have it really hot and then you drop the temperature really quickly. And dropping the temperature really quickly gets you to this gamma and a little bit of alpha, which is the type two. Then if you were to wanna make alpha, which is type two, you cool it fast, but not quite as fast. So imagine putting it in the freezer. Then you get into this area where you have alpha crystals and you don't have to hold it at this temperature for it to have those crystals. As soon as they're solid, 
those crystals will stay at least for a while in your chocolate. Then if you want it form types three or four, you cool it a little bit less slowly or a little bit less fast. So instead of putting it in the freezer, you might put it in the fridge. Uh, then type five and eventually type six, but type five when you want to form that, which is what we're trying to do in tempering. We're trying to get that shiny, beautiful type five chocolate. You first heat up the chocolate until it's melted, then cool it down just slightly until it's in this area where you've got beta prime and beta, which is type three, four and type five, six, and then heat it up just slightly to get rid of those type three, four that you don't want and end up with just type five and eventually type six. So uh, now that you know how they're, how they're made um, and what the different types are, this is what the different types look like. Uh, so I know uh, probably the first thing that a lot of you are noticing is they all look the same. And I did this specifically because they look a little different after some time sitting out. It can take chocolate up to 12 hours to fully crystallize. And then it blooms usually like after that um, or kind of along that 12 hour process of full crystallization. But I think what's really important to note is when you're making chocolate, it's really hard to tell what the different crystal types are when you're when it's melted or just solidified. I, I would say even highly trained chocolatiers, uh, it would be difficult to tell just by looking at it. Um, so that's kind of where some of the tips I'll give you on uh, how to look for good temper will come in. But as you can see, they kind of all look the same. This is uh, type one, gamma one, alpha two, beta three, beta four, beta five. This is the one that you really want. This is a fully tempered piece that I made. Um, and then type six from sitting on a shelf. So one thing that doesn't look so much the same about these chocolates is how they bend, flex, break when they're solid. So this is the type one and I'm gonna share sound. All right, cool. Uh, this is a little piece and I'm just gonna show myself like manipulating it and bending it. So as you can see in here, it really bends and flexes super easily. Um, it barely even cracks there when it's it's bent completely 180 on itself. So uh, that's important to know because you can just see how soft it is. Then this is type two, uh, as you'll as you can see from this screen grab right now, and when you'll you'll see the video, it still has no snap. It breaks a little bit easier, so it's a little bit more stable in that kind of way. So you've got that break line and it still squeezes and flexes a little bit, but it's more like a putty. Then beta three is even a little bit harder. It cracks a little bit more. You see that crack right there rather than just barely cracking like the other one did, but it still is very putty-like and fairly soft. And as you can probably hear, there's still no crack, no um, audible crack whatsoever. Then this, uh, don't mistake the crackling of the paper in the background for a crack. This is type four. This is what happens when you just drop melted chocolate on the table and let it cool at room temperature. Then you can see it's much more prone to cracking rather than bending, but it still doesn't snap. It doesn't really hold uh, its shape against bending. It's, it's more likely to snap, it's still soft. Then this is type five. This is what you want. And if you listen, you can hear the snap when it breaks and you can see the really clean break line in the chocolate. So I'm gonna play that just one more time to that, that break. This is what you want. You can also see the surface is uh, fairly shiny, but it's that, it's that kind of pop sound that when, when it breaks, that's really important. And it's a really good way for you to tell 
uh, when you have fully crystallized chocolate and you don't see any bloom, that it's it's correct. And that's what people want also when you're eating chocolate, you want it to break really nicely like that. So this is type six. This is the kind that you can't make from melted chocolate that you have to, uh, the, the only way to get it is to have your chocolate sitting on a shelf um, in storage for 16 plus weeks and it gets this really chalky look to it. And I've got a cool video of kind of digging into it. So you can see it breaks up really easily into these little chunks um, and they, they've got a really chalky appearance. When you eat it, it's, it's kind of drier and crumbles really easily in your mouth. It's not um, my favorite texture, but this chocolate still can be melted back down and retempered to make it uh, beautiful and shiny and deliciously textured again. So tempering. Now that we know what chocolate crystals are, what they look like, what the different kinds are, uh, we wanna figure out how to manipulate them and make the kind of uh, type five crystals that we want. So first of all, some things to know about chocolate tempering. Um, no chocolate will be all one crystal type. So any, even a small piece of chocolate has hundreds of thousands, even millions of little crystals in it. So no matter how hard you try, you're not gonna be able to get every single one of them to be the type beta five crystals that you want. The goal is to get them to be mostly type beta five crystals. Each crystal type uh, forms and melts at a different temperature. So the process of tempering is to manipulate the temperature so you get mostly beta five crystals. The most important factors in this process are temperature, time, and motion. So temperature, obviously you have to get to the right temperature where uh, only the crystals that you want are stable. You have to uh, do that over a certain amount of time because even if you hold it at the perfect temperature, if you hold it there for too long, it can destroy the crystals that you want or allow formation of crystals that you don't want. And also motion. As I mentioned, when we were looking at that phase diagram earlier, the time scale on that went out to like hundred thousands of minutes. And you don't wanna wait that long to temper your chocolate. But by mixing your chocolate, by keeping it in motion, you can spread around the crystals that are starting to grow and get them to uh, start up crystal growth in different areas of your chocolate, which causes that process to happen much faster. And uh, this photo is just kind of like a, a fun look at the surface of what untempered versus tempered chocolate will look like. The untempered chocolate just meaning any crystal type other than uh, the type five and type six will give this kind of dull, sheen and tempered chocolate will be shiny and snap really well. So in general, there are two approaches to tempering. Um, if you remember from that phase diagram, to get to that uh, beta, the beta five crystals that you want, you have to cool down and then heat back up just a little bit. So that is what this graph is. You heat the chocolate all the way up to melt away any existing crystals that are in the chocolate, kind of resetting it then you cool it down and cooling all the way down to here forms both beta four, which is the type you don't want, and beta five, which is the type you do want. Then this heating step just gets rid of those beta four crystals that you don't want. Then while you're working on it, you can hold it at this temperature. Uh, this is part of where time comes into play. You don't wanna hold it here for forever, but you can hold it here for uh, a while. And then when you're done uh, casting it or uh, dipping with it or whatever you're doing, you cool it slowly to room temperature. Um, I have this little thing in here, don't refrigerate. You can refrigerate for a little while, but I'll get into uh, what exactly can be troublesome about refrigeration a little bit later. Uh, then there's this other way of tempering called seeded temper, where you can kind of skip this dipping step by giving the chocolate a little bit of a head start in crystallizing those beta fives that you want. You add in seed crystals. If you remember from that crystallization video, you saw a, a single little crystal drop into the water and that caused all this crystallization. You can do the same thing with chocolate. You drop in little uh, pieces of chocolate that have the crystal type you want and they can start that growth. And it, it won't happen as fast because you're mixing the chocolate, you're disturbing the crystals as they're growing, but that's good. That way it can stay liquid and have those seed crystals so that when you do cast it into a mold, those crystals can grow more quickly than the other types of crystals. So uh, you guys are probably gonna get sick of this graph, you're gonna see it a lot. 
when you look at the back of a chocolate bag, um, often it will have these tempering curves on it, or sometimes they're called crystallization curves. This is a Calibo bag. This is a Guitard bag. Um, this is a dark chocolate. This is a milk chocolate. Um, but basically they show, um, if you're starting here at the melting temperature, this, this axis is time. They don't tell you that, but it's time. And the reason they don't have any labels here is because the time is kind of up to you. You figure that out based on what your machinery can do, how fast you can track the temperature. Uh, but you can see this top point is the melting point. That's this like red circle here. Um, then you've got this bottom portion um, is kind of the, the lower temperature you drop it to. It doesn't really have a name. Um, super specifically, and then the upper of this, or kind of the middle temperature here, this is the um, temper point, it's called. So just to kind of label those. And then the difference between this lower temperature and this middle temperature is called the delta. Um, Amy, I just want to interrupt for a second. Somebody is asking, you know, to describe a little bit more on the difference between the, uh, you know, the crystallization temperature and the melting temperature. How does it affect each other? How, the, how does it differ? So can you please do it? Yeah, definitely. So um, you can think about it like the melting temperature of, well, ice is a little bit of a, I'll, I'll give ice as a simple metaphor. So in ice, uh, the melting temperature is where you get the, like if you have a chunk of ice, the melting temperature is where you get the chunk to become a liquid. That same temperature, if you were to go in the opposite direction, is the crystallization temperature. So in ice, they're the same thing. In chocolate, they're different because there's different crystal types you can form. So this melting temperature, this is the temperature at which all crystal types in chocolate are destroyed. They become fully liquid. They don't have any structure to them. And that's resetting your chocolate basically from scratch. You have no um, seed crystals for crystallization to start. Then this crystallization temperature, this crystallization curve, um, it's got this bottom temperature. This bottom temperature is the, uh, it's the crystallization temperature of type five, but it's below the crystallization temperature of type four. So you're forming both type five and type four, and then you're going above the crystallization temperature of type four. So you're melting just the type four, but you're keeping the type five. So there are different crystallization temperatures for the different chocolate types. I don't know if I'm going to go all the way back, but you, what you're trying to do is just go all the way up above all of the crystallization temperatures so you get rid of all the crystals. Then just get the crystals you want, or just get one of the crystals you want and one of the ones you don't, and then just melts away the one that you don't. So you're left only with the ones you want. I hope that answers your question. If not, feel free to ask more. And then one more question is they're asking like a lot of people uh, in other warmer climates, uh, you know, the room temperature is much higher than US or Europe. How do they handle that? Yeah, so that one is tricky uh, because the longer you give chocolate to cool, uh, it, it's kind of a dance. The longer you give chocolate to cool to a certain extent, um, you give it more opportunity for those other crystal types that you don't want to form. That being said, uh, I would say the most important thing is humidity. So if you're in a high humidity environment, you need to have a dehumidifier. You need to try to make sure the environment that your chocolate is cooling in, whether that's like in the room you're working in, or if you have like a dehumidified little um, container that it's cooling in a low humidity environment. I would, uh, you can put it in the fridge. I, I will get into the fridge stuff that I was talking about a little bit. Um, you can put it in the fridge for a little while to kind of jumpstart that cooling. Um, I would not leave it in the fridge to cool for the entire process. So that might help kind of bring the temperature down quickly. But in general, you want to try to work in a temperature controlled environment. So if you can get to a place that has air conditioning or get a, in our office, we had to get like a separate air conditioning unit um, that vents to the outside for the room where we temper chocolate because it needs to be low humidity and stay generally pretty cool while we're working. Also, if you can temper chocolate in the winter, that helps. But, you know, some places are warmer all year long. So um, adapting to that can be a, a little bit of a, a dance, like I said. So as I was talking about, this is the traditional three-step temper. 
this is what you do if you have no seed crystals to work with. So say you get a big hunk of chocolate that's uh, already crumbly. It's been sitting on a shelf for months and uh, it doesn't have, you can tell kind of looking from the surface of it that it looks like those type six crystals. It doesn't have any of the type five that you want. So this is kind of starting from scratch um, in all of the ways. You heat up all the chocolate all the way to melting, continually mixing it to reintegrate all of those uh, stuff that has come to the surface, bloomed, made it kind of chalky. Uh, then you cool it down a lot to start forming those beta four and beta five crystals. You heat it slightly back up to melt away the beta four crystals, hold it at the working temperature and then cool it when you're done. And uh, this is a seeded temper. So you heat it up all the way to melt the crystals. But then when you're dropping the temperature, you don't have to go all the way down and then back up. You can just go straight to the working temperature that is in, like on these bags, you can just go straight from here to here without going down and then back up if you're able to do seated temper because you're introducing the type five crystals that you want. You're dropping in those seed crystals that go, oh, make this kind. And so by mixing it, those get introduced all throughout the chocolate. They create little tiny seed crystals of the type five that you want all over in the chocolate so that when you're done working it and you cool it down, those crystals are more likely to form. Regardless of what temper type you do, whether you do the uh, the three step or the seated temper, checking your temper is really important. Um, as you saw from those chocolate samples that I showed earlier, it's really hard to tell by just looking at the chocolate if it's ready, especially when it's in liquid, if it's in good temper. So uh, a kind of common practice, something that I do personally all the time is uh, you take, I usually use metal utensils because they allow heat transfer a little bit easier. They cool down the chocolate a little faster. Um, I dip a spoon or a knife into the chocolate as I'm mixing it when I'm when I think it's in good temper and I let it sit on the counter for one to five minutes. Um, it should mostly harden in that time. It's not gonna be that kind of snapping chocolate that you want likely in those five minutes, but you will be able to see it harden. And if it doesn't harden, if it stays liquid, then you know your chocolate is not properly tempered. And you either need to start over in the process or kind of assess where you are in the process. Usually what I do when I'm pretty sure that it should be in temper, but it's not, is I, I usually start the process over. There, here's a couple things to look for when you're tempering to kind of tell if something is going wrong. Um, this is over crystallization. This is when you want the chocolate to be liquid, you want it to be easy to work with, but it's just solidifying too quickly. Um, this video on the left that I'm about to show, it's in um, a machine that we use the ChocoVision uh, Delta and or ChocoVision 5, and it's got a bowl that rotates and it's got a baffle, kind of this uh, intermediary dam that stays in place. So the baffle scrapes the bowl and you can see the chocolate, which is this uh, mass here kind of rotating with the bowl. So the chocolate is just kind of forming this solid ball up on the side. Um, and that's because it has too many crystals already formed. Uh, I made it too cool too quickly and that caused the chocolate to start to solidify even as it's moving. Um, when this happens, you can raise the temperature by less than three degrees Fahrenheit or less than two degrees Celsius. But the problem with that is if you raise it just even a little bit too much, you'll destroy those precious type five seed crystals that you really want. Um, when tempering chocolate I've found is a, at least at first, a really uh, a process you got to do a lot to figure it out. So I always keep really careful notes of the temperatures I'm using for tempering, um, about how long I'm at each step. And uh, something that you can make in your notes when you see this is that you should increase your working temperature the next time, um, that it needs to be just a little bit higher. And you can see in some of the bags, they have guidance on this. So um, Calibo, you can see it, they tell you here, this is about where you should start your working temperature, but if you need to go up to here, that's okay. There's less guidance about that on some bags, but uh, Calibo is nice in that way. And I know a lot of you guys are doing bean to bar, so that's something that you kind of have to figure out for yourself.
So this is under crystallization. This is the other side of the spectrum. If you don't have enough type five crystals uh, forming, you get bloom. So this is kind of like this uh, kind of marbling effect you see in the photo is uh, difficult or impossible to see while you're tempering. But what you can see while you're tempering that can tell you that this is happening is your chocolate is, uh, it, if your chocolate is not normally very thin, your chocolate will be thinner than expected, more watery. Um, and then when you do the dip test that I was talking about, your chocolate won't solidify in the one to five minutes that you're expecting. So this is essentially that you uh, went up too high in this, like after you did the dip, you went up too high here and melted away the beta fives that you wanted. Or if you did the, uh, if you didn't do the dip step, if you just did the seeding step, you didn't seed enough. And so there weren't enough of those type beta five crystal seeds that you want. And you ended up with other crystal types growing and the other crystal types cause this bloom. This is kind of a combination of both fat and sugar bloom. So speaking of fat and sugar bloom, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what Bloom is and what it looks like. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, one second, sorry. Uh, somebody asked about what's the 34.5 temperature written on the berry calibre. Can you explain that a little bit? And also they want to know what's the ideal relative humidity for a controlled environment in a tempering process. Yeah, yeah, those are both great questions. So the 34.5, let me go to a picture where it doesn't have all this stuff written on it. Um, the 34.5 here is the upper working temperature that you can use. So they're basically saying don't go above that temperature when you're working the chocolate or it will melt away all of the precious seed crystals that you work so hard to make. And then you'll get that under crystallized chocolate that blooms that I was showing earlier. So this range here is like this temperature, this range of temperatures is a good working temperature, but if your chocolate starts to overcrystallize, it starts to solidify too fast, then you can go up to this temperature before you melt away those beta-5 crystals. But if you go above that, then you're gonna start to be in trouble. Oh, and the relative humidity question. So um, when you're tempering chocolate, you want less than 50% relative humidity in the room you're working in. Um, that can be hard to achieve, I understand, in some more uh, temperate, or sorry, in more humid in climates, but a way to do that that I've found is if you can create a low humidity chamber by maybe taking a box and putting some dehumidifying uh, powder or stuff in there, that's good. Um, just whatever you can do to lower the humidity below 50% when you're working chocolate. So, bloom. So there's two types of bloom. Generally, there's sugar bloom and fat bloom. So sugar bloom kind of has this chalky, dusty, um, powder-like feel to it. And uh, it's a little bit whiter usually than fat bloom and it can brush off with a fingertip. It won't completely come off, but you can see it start to brush off when you rub it. Um, it's caused by high humidity. So if you're storing chocolate um, at greater than 50% humidity, if you're, um, casting chocolate in greater than 50% humidity, especially higher like 70 plus humidity, this can cause sugar bloom. Then the other type is fat bloom. So fat bloom is more waxy looking. It's more cream colored usually um, rather than this kind of pure white that the sugar is. It, when you run your finger across it, it smears rather than coming off um, or dusting off. Um, and it also, it, it feels kind of waxy if you rub your finger across uh, fat bloom and then rub them together, you can feel this kind of like waxy-ness. Uh, it's caused by improper tempering. Um, so if you overheat it, you cause the incorrect crystal types and the incorrect crystal types allow fat bloom to happen or overheating and temperature fluctuations during storage. So if you are if you have your chocolate sitting in a warehouse and the warehouse doesn't have, uh, or the air conditioning goes out in the middle of the summer, then you might get fat bloom because the temperature of your chocolate can go up just a little too much. And then that causes the fat to be able to come to the surface. And bloom is just ingredients of the chocolate separating out and coming to the surface. So in sugar bloom, that's the sugar. In fat bloom, that's the fat. So a little bit of science here as in chemistry as to why sugar bloom happens. So um, polar, the, the polarity of a molecule is just 
if it has one side that has a concentration of positive and one side that has a concentration of negative charge. So in sugar, you can see this molecule has a few more minuses, few more negative charges on this side and a few more positive charges on this side. So kind of like a bar magnet, it has a positive side and a negative side. Water also has that. Water has this positive side by the hydrogens and a negative side by the oxygen. So those, uh, those bar magnets, basically the opposite sides are attracted to each other. So the attraction between water and sugar is kind of strong and the attraction, um, and it's of the, the negative side of the sugar and the positive side of the water or the vice versa, you know, the negative side of the water and the positive side of the sugar. Cocoa butter, on the other hand, cocoa butter is what's called nonpolar. It doesn't have a concentration of positives or negatives on either side. So the attraction between sugar and cocoa butter is a lot weaker than the attraction between water and sugar. That means that sugar kind of prefers to be with water. So if you get a little bit of water on the surface of your chocolate, it's gonna, it's gonna attract the sugar to the surface of the chocolate. And then when that water evaporates, the sugar will just be left sitting on the surface of your chocolate, which is why it's kind of chalky and you can brush it off. Um, additionally, this can be prevented by controlling the humidity. So if you have a high humidity, it's more likely that tiny droplets of water will condense on the surface of your chocolate and cause this kind of bloom. Most refrigerators have a humidity of over 65%. So it's not really anything about the refrigerator being cold. That's the problem when you put chocolate in the fridge. It's that fridges have this kind of high internal humidity in general, and that internal humidity can cause condensation of water on the surface of the chocolate and then bloom. Additionally, when you take warm chocolate and you put it in the fridge, you can imagine uh, Warm air holds more air, or holds more water in general than cold air. So if you have uh, these chocolates that you just made and the air around the surface of the warm chocolate is holding some water, then when you put it in the fridge, all of the water in that kind of warm air pocket around your chocolate can condense on the surface of your chocolate and cause bloom. If you're really careful about controlling the humidity of your chocolate, um, controlling the humidity of the air around your chocolate. You can avoid this problem and still put things in the refrigerator, but because of that general higher humidity, storing your chocolate in the refrigerator is not recommended. And if you're cooling it in the fridge, I don't re recommend keeping it in there for very long. And by very long, I mean on the scale of like hours. Okay, one question um, on this, Amy. Somebody is asking that in Honduras, where they don't have a refrigeration, but humidity is higher. How do they overcome uh, the kind of those conditions to make the tempering correctly? Yeah, so uh, that's that's one of the more difficult environments in which to temper chocolate. Um, I will say some ways you can go about it is. Uh, Refrigeration is not the most important thing in tempering chocolate. You can cool tempered chocolate to a, a perfect temper in even a slightly warmer environment. It's not ideal, but you can do it. The most important thing is controlling the humidity and making sure the temperature doesn't get too high. So um, as long as you're below that, as long as you have the chocolate at a temperature which it can cool to solid, you're okay. Uh, even if it takes a while, you just need to be really careful about controlling the humidity. So what I would recommend is having some type of controlled humidity environment, like a box with, um, there's stuff called desiccant. You want to be really careful and make sure that you get stuff that um, is food safe, but that kind of pulls humidity out of the air. And that allows whatever's in that enclosed environment to be really low humidity. So if you cool it in that type of environment, that should help prevent bloom. Okay, um, how about uh, storing the chocolate in the fridge after tempering and molding? What about it? I guess. You know, that's the tough thing because you said the why, you know, uh, refrigerator has a 60% humidity and it can attract the sugar molecules and cause the sugar bloom. So I think they're asking, is it okay to uh, leave the tempered chocolate in the fridge for storing or does it going to affect the blooming? I would not recommend leaving your uh, tempered chocolate in the fridge. If you wanted to, I mean, 
it, the general guidance is don't leave tempered chocolate in the fridge. But if you really wanted to, you could try vacuum sealing your chocolate so that it prevents any humidity from getting close to your chocolate and keep it at that temperature. I've not personally tried that, so I can't speak to if it works or not. The general guidance is the refrigerator is bad for chocolate. That being said, from my research, the uh, most key part of that is that the humidity in the refrigerator is bad for chocolate. So if you can keep the humidity away from the surface of your chocolate, that's good. That being said, just wrapping your chocolate in a foil, um, like most people do when they package chocolates uh, or a wrapper of some kind is not gonna do it. That's not gonna seal out the humidity. So you have to like vacuum seal it in some type of air type container or something like that. Um, but again, that's, that's theoretical. I've not personally done that. Um, fat bloom. So fat bloom is when the cocoa butter, the fat inside the chocolate comes out to the surface. And uh, this, this photo here, this is it kind of, you can see the spiky uh, crystals of the fat coming through the surface. And this might remind you of the spiky cocoa butter fat ball that we saw earlier. Um, that's because it's essentially doing the same thing. It's growing these little uh, spikes out of the surface. So this happens when um, you get temperature fluctuations in the chocolate that allow uh, the fat to melt a little bit and come to the surface. And then it, it kind of grows out of the surface. And this is what it looks like on a really, really small scale. This scale bar is uh, five micrometers and um, a hundred of those is the width of a human hair. So this is very, very small. Um, so you can't actually see these spikes. What you see is this waxy look on the surface of your chocolates. This doesn't actually mean that your temper is bad. A lot of you may have seen kind of this white waxy coating on uh, the surface of chocolate chips or little chocolate pieces that you're using. It just means that the temperature storage for it wasn't perfect the entire lifetime that it was sitting in storage. Uh, this can be prevented by having proper tempering and really controlling the temperature of your storage. So bloom uh, happens over time, no matter what. You can do everything perfectly. You can get the perfect temper. It can have that beautiful snap. It can be shiny. It can be exactly what you want. And then you sit it on a shelf for 16 weeks and you come back and it looks like this. Um, even if you control the temperature and the humidity perfectly the whole time. And that's because eventually these type five crystals that you work so hard to make are gonna turn into type six crystals because type six is a little bit more stable. So uh, the transition, it, it's basically like going downhill. Type five is here, type six is here. Even if the time scale is way out here, eventually it's gonna go downhill until it's type six. And when it's doing this transition, because it's going downhill, because it's uh, more stable as type six, it's losing tiny amounts of energy. And that energy is uh, put off as heat. And that, like, you can't even measure it if you were to have uh, a thermometer stuck in the chunk of chocolate, you could not measure the tiny releases of heat, but those cause micro melts, which lead to fat bloom. Micro melts is just like in a tiny little area, like maybe a couple molecules of chocolate will, or of, sorry, the cocoa butter will melt and can come to the surface. So that's why you see this very mottled like mixture of both sugar bloom and fat bloom. It's even it's kind of impossible to tell where the sugar bloom starts and where the fat bloom ends. Um, but that's because chocolate is what's known as a meta stable mixture. So chocolate, as I talked about earlier, is the cocoa fats. It's got the non-fatty cocoa solids. Um, it's got sugar, um, soy lectin, sometimes some other ingredients like milk fat or cream. Um, all of those are meta stable, meaning they're stable for now. But if something happens, like a lot of time or fluctuations in temperature or exposure to water, that will change and it will no longer be stable in that form. So this is to say, none of your chocolate will last forever, no matter what. And forever is on the scale of 16 weeks at most a year, two years, if you're perfectly careful with storing it. So now that you've learned all the things that can go wrong in basic tempering, I just wanted to tell you some more things that could go wrong when you're tempering. And this is not to scare you, this is to give you tools to avoid these things. Uh, before you go to that, uh, somebody is asking about the, the milk chocolate. Is there any minimum proportion of cocoa butter versus milk fat for a good snappy crystallization? 
and then is there any relationship between milk fat content and decrease of the temperature in the tempering curve is there any measurable ratio for these uh, more fat uh, milk less temperature in the tempering curve and then how does the addition of milk fat to other fats like olive oil affects the crystallization so it's a, like a lot of questions on the milk yeah fat. yeah so i don't know if there's any uh, minimum kind of ratio. I do know that as you add more milk fats, it interrupts the crystal structure of the cocoa butter. So um, I don't, per I can't personally say I know of like a minimum number ratio, but um, once you get past a certain point, and I'm sorry, I don't know what that point is, you lose the ability to form a stable, what's called matrix, a, a stable um, structure of those cocoa butter crystals through the whole uh, structure of the chocolate. But um, when you add more milk fat, that does lower both the melting temperature and the temper point of the chocolate because there's less of those crystals to crystallize. And I, there's some more guidance on that online. In general, that stuff is pretty experimental from what I've found. It's just like chocolatiers, what they've found to work. Um, so that is going to require some more playing around. What I highly recommend in this kind of uh, situation is just temper a bunch of small batches yourself um, and keep really careful notes of what works and what doesn't and try to build that relationship for yourself. Something that has been kind of frustrating in learning about chocolate for me from a scientific perspective um, is there's fairly little research on it um, academically. There's a lot of people who've written blogs about what they did and what worked for them. Um, but there's not a lot of really concrete uh, relationships in the kind of mathematical way that you're talking about. Um, I wish there were. There's some information on addition of separate fats. What I was talking about uh, kind of in the ingredient slide was compound chocolates and how a compound chocolate is when you replace cocoa butter with a different fat. Um, cocoa butter doesn't always play super nice with other fats. Um, I mean, it does really well with uh, milk fats, cream, that kind of stuff. Um, in general, when you replace, when you add in other oils, I, I don't have a ton of experience with that, but you can't guarantee that they're going to be as stable, as I just mentioned, meta stable as just cocoa butter and the other ingredients in chocolate. So um, you can try that out. I, I can't say I've done a ton of research on the mixing of different fats because oil is still a fat, mixing of different oils and fats in chocolate. Um, yeah, I, I can get back to you on that, but that's the most I know about it at that I can pull this time at this time. Um, so other things that can go wrong in addition to the cocoa butter stuff that I was just talking about in tempering, shocking. So shocking is a common term for just getting it too cold too quickly. Um, as I talked about when I was talking about the crystal types, type one crystals are what's formed when you shock the chocolate, when you cool it really, really fast. So uh, what's in this bowl I made by um, melting chocolate and then mixing or stirring it over a bowl of ice water. So I made really care, I was really careful not to get any of the water from the bowl because that causes separate problems, not to get any of the water from the bowl into the chocolate, but um, kind of through this double boiler, it wasn't boiling, double um, bowl setup, I had the bottom of this bowl sitting in ice water cooled very quickly and I was mixing the chocolate. Um, so it crystallized in this kind of like it hard, um, it wasn't shiny, it wasn't going to become shiny and it still did that kind of Play-Doh-y thing that I showed in the video of type one crystals. This type of chocolate, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it it's not appe as appealing, it's not usually what chocolatiers want to give their customers. Um, but it can absolutely be remelted and uh, used for tempering. So if you were to remelt this and go through the proper tempering steps, you could still get beautifully tempered chocolate. Scorching is when you get your chocolate too hot. So um, like with anything that you get too hot, it breaks it down. It starts to break down um, the molecules that make it up. And uh, 
that leads to trouble when you're trying to temper it if you wanted to try to remelt it and retemper it later on because you've broken down some of those very basic molecules that you need in order to temper it you may have broken apart some of those tuning forks of triglycerides um it's sm some of the more common ways to tell that this is happening is you can smell that it's burning and it doesn't always smell like something that is blackened burnt you know but it might smell um a little bit like a campfire, or uh, if you've ever made s'mores, it might smell a little bit like that chocolate when it just gets really hot. Um, you can also see in this, you can see just, this is supposed to be pure white at the bottom. And it's got this kind of like grainy brown color to it. And that's because some of the molecules in the chocolate are separating out and sticking to the surface rather than coming off when I was scraping it. Um, and also you see, it's, it was really hard to get a video of this. So I'll just describe it. Um, the way it moved was different. Normally chocolate kind of moves in one mass together. After I scorched it, there was a big glob basically that when I would tilt the mug, one glob would quickly slide to the side and then the rest of the chocolate would kind of stick to the bottom and slowly flow. So it that's kind of the different components separating out and starting to break down. Um, also, it won't solidify. It may solidify over like a long time, but it won't solidify nearly as easily. It will often take hours and hours to even start to solidify. I mean, this chocolate that I poured out here, um, I took this photo after letting it sit for like three hours. So it, it was still completely liquid at that point. Um, something to know about this is because you've started to break down that important molecular structure, you usually can't salvage this chocolate. You can't retemper it and melt it down. So you wanna be careful. This happens um, only when you get it really, really hot. So um, if you get it like above 130 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it can do this. Uh, a good way to tell is if you can smell it burning or see it bubbling, you might be scorching your chocolate. And you can always try to retemper it and see if it works, you know, but um, just avoiding scorching is the best way to, uh, avoiding overheating and scorching is uh, a good way <laughs> to be able to reuse your chocolate. Seizing. So seizing is when you get water in your chocolate while you're mixing it. So you might be able to see bloom um, when you're when you have a solid piece of chocolate and you just get water on the surface. But seizing is what happens when you get water in the chocolate as you're mixing it. It's harder to see bloom right away, but you can see changes in texture of the chocolate. So it makes it kind of grainy. If you look at the surface of this, you can see that it's it's more like a an icing at this point, uh, rather than, and I, all I did was take and sprinkle a couple uh, droplets of water into this chocolate as I was mixing it. Um, it looks a lot more like a grainy icing rather than a smooth chocolate. Um, it will not get the same type of shiny uh, when it solidifies. This is it after sitting for uh, a little bit less than an hour. Um, it's not salvageable as traditional chocolate. So you can't retemper this and make it into that beautiful shiny chocolate. That mixture of water um, causes concentrations of the sugar in different areas and it won't reintegrate into the chocolate. It won't reintegrate with the fat. Um, it can be used in recipes like ganache, but it can't be retempered into chocolate. Okay, couple of questions on this one. Uh, they want to know at what temperature does the chocolate start to scorch? Um, generally above, um, it's, it's different for different chocolates, but um, I, the, I generally don't take any chocolate above 130 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head what that is in Celsius, um, but a good way to tell is you want to watch out for any bubbling. And if you see bubbling, you want to turn down the temperature right away. Uh, the other one is, uh, you know, they're asking, uh, they, uh, their customers are asking for vegan tofu, but it's not common in chocolate. Is that the reason? Because milk fat mixes better than the cocoa butter and the other, you know, the other fats for the vegan fats may not be mixing with the cocoa butter? Yeah, that's possible. I, I can't say I've done a ton of research into um, vegan chocolates, but um, one thing that's interesting is there are some common chocolates uh, some common uh, substitutes for different fats. I just haven't seen a lot of them combined with uh, cocoa butter. For If you're looking for a vegan chocolate, the easiest way to do it is to just use 
uh, cocoa butter. There's, uh, I believe it's Covetshire chocolate, which is um, you have traditional um, dark chocolate and you basically add more cocoa butter. And if you add more cocoa butter and more sugar, um, that can make the chocolate sweeter without adding any of those like non-vegan animal-based fats. Uh, but that could be a very good reason as to why it's harder to make uh, vegan milk chocolate because it's harder to get those um, fat substitutes to mix. The next question is the scarced chocolate. Can they, you know, use it or it, can they salvage it? Or if so, what is the ratio they have to use with the good chocolate? I don't know, actually. Uh, in general, um, I mean, I know this is easier said than done. The best practice is to just really try to avoid scorching your chocolate. Um, I've not tried to use scorched chocolate, so I can't particularly say. Um, yeah, I don't have any uh, experiential knowledge on that. If your chocolate, like the chocolate that I scorched in this photo, I didn't scorch a ton. I mean, I could smell it burning um, and I could, but it, it wasn't blackened anywhere. Um, it didn't bubble a ton. I think I could mix like this amount of chocolate into one of my normal uh, five pound plus batches and it might've been okay. I just, I, I don't really know. Um, the more you scorch it, the less likely you are to be able to reuse it. So the more you can smell it burning, the more you see it separating, the grainier it is, the more it bubbles, uh, the less salvageable it is. Um, is there any uh, optimum temperature for or delta T to set chocolate with the maximized type? I think it should be type five. They put type six once it's seeded. Once it's seeded? Um, I don't, I mean, once it's seeded, it kind of takes over from there. The the crystal growth takes over from there. There's no, um, oh, oh, do you mean for working? For working it as in when it's, when I say working, I mean the chocolate is liquid, uh, but it has been seeded. It has been fully tempered. Um, and you're trying to just keep it liquid for pouring and dipping purposes. The optimum temperature to set it to is going to be different for every chocolate. Um, there's some general guidance online as to like, this is the range for milk chocolate. This is the range for dark chocolate. Um, if you have a chocolate supplier that provides, or you can get them to provide those crystallization curves that I was showing, um, that when it goes down and then back up, that up temperature is your ideal working temperature. Um, if you're making your own chocolate, you can go off of some of that general guidance, but my recommendation is do a lot of experimenting with small batches, find that temperature for yourself where it is a good texture for you to work with it, but you don't destroy those type five crystals that you want. I know that's maybe not as satisfying of an answer, but the truth of it is the temperatures for processing chocolate change drastically with the origin of the chocolate, the uh, origin of the cocoa butter, the percentage of um, cocoa butter versus sugar. And it's just not something that has been scientifically studied in as much detail because chocolate is a composite and something composite just means it has multiple ingredients and something being a composite hugely complicates the relationships between the different ingredients. Uh, somebody asked uh, when they grind the chocolate in their melanger, it reaches about 56 to 60 degrees Celsius. Are they asking you, does it going to affect the crystallization later? 56 to 60 degrees Celsius. Let me just do. Uh, I'm, com I'm converting that. Uh, actually, I don't believe so. So first of all, that's not um, out of the range of that kind of like 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 160 degrees Celsius is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm just saying that for myself. Um, that's not too hot. If you, the other side of that is you're going to retemper it after. Um, you're not scorching it at that point. Um, if you smell it burning, that's a warning sign. But even that, like, because you're going to mix it and retemper it after, you can really watch for that. Um, 
but I don't, I don't think 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, I, I don't think 100, I don't think 60 degrees Celsius is too hot. So some things to remember um, in general, kind of bringing it all back together. All traditional real chocolate contains cocoa butter. So uh, there is compound chocolate, which is cocoa, or which is chocolate that has some other type of fat besides uh, cocoa butter. So, you know, like Mars and um, Hershey use uh, sometimes palm kern oil, uh, other vegetable oil fats uh, to make their chocolate instead of cocoa butter because it makes it easier to process. It doesn't have to do this complex tempering. Um, also, cocoa butter, uh, that cocoa fat is what requires this special heat processing uh, to form one crystal type, um, and that crystal type is beta-5. You want to form beta-5 in order to have that shiny crystal type that you want. Um, all of those other crystal types, I mean, they might be useful for something, but they're not really useful for chocolate making because they don't look as good. Um, in general, bloom is the enemy, not even in general. I mean, like if you see bloom on your chocolate, a lot the kind of, what a lot of people think is if they see any whitish film on their chocolate, that means their chocolate has gone bad. A lot of people think that that's mold. Um, it's not, it's the separation of the sugar or the fat out of the chocolate. But that does mean that either your storage conditions or your tempering were incorrect and, uh, or that your chocolate has just been sitting for too long and it needs to be retempered. Retempering can kind of reset the clock and allow your chocolate to uh, not bloom as easily. So if you have bloom chocolate, you can just retemper it and uh, it's back to that perfect shiny, shiny beta five that you want. Um, for bloom, if you see sugar bloom, you know you have humidity problems or water problems. If you see fat bloom, you know you have temperature fluctuation problems or you overheated it when you were tempering. Tempering methods. So the most important things to remember are time, temperature, and motion. Um, to have it at the right temperatures, to have it uh, not held at any of those temperatures for too much time, and to keep it constantly in motion. There's two general kind of profiles. Uh, there's the three-step temper that you do if you have no seed, and uh, meaning no pre-crystallized type five of the type you want. Um, and then there's seeded temper, which is a little bit, in my experience, more reliable. If you have little chunks of already tempered chocolate, of the kind you want, you can drop them in and that kind of gets that crystallization process kick-started for just the type five crystals. So uh, now that we've covered the basics, there's some extra tips, tricks, and some fun stuff about chocolate tempering. So this one was specifically requested, uh, marble tempering. So this is a, a fairly common way of tempering chocolate. Uh, but one thing that you may not realize is that it actually does still follow that type three profile, or sorry, the, uh, the three-step chocolate tempering profile that I was talking about. So you're heating up the chocolate here at first, and then the reason you pour it onto the marble table is to cool it down. There's nothing particularly magical about marble that makes it good for this. I mean, marble conducts heat really well, so it kind of pulls the heat out of the chocolate more quickly than um, some other materials might, but you just pour it onto the surface of the marble and then you're moving it around constantly because if you didn't move it, then the bottom of the chocolate would solidify and the top of the chocolate would stay liquid and then you just have chunks of solid chocolate inside sort of melty chocolate. So when you're marble tempering, you just kind of spread it all around the surface of this marble slab um, and you're only doing that with about two thirds of your chocolate. So that cooling process, you're also trying to watch the temperature and make sure that you hit that low point in the three-step tempering process. Uh, then you pour your cooled down semi-crystallized chocolate with those seed crystals back into the remaining third of your chocolate. And by combining those two, the warm remaining third of your chocolate heats up that cooled two thirds of chocolate a little bit and does that last heating up step, getting rid of those beta four crystals that you don't want. So it's still doing the heat up, cool down on the marble, heat back up by adding in the warm chocolate thing that you were doing in just the basic three-step tempering. Something else that you may see is uh, warping during solidification of your cast pieces. So 
I, uh, these are photos from my own tempering. We were trying out a new shape, so we made our own molds, uh, but the molds we have were really thin. So they allowed the chocolate to warp and also the chocolate was cooling so fast uh, because it was so thin that it was warping like this. So um, really thin features that you're casting can warp more. Um, if you have a thinner mold that's able to flex, that allows it to warp even more because what was happening here is even as the chocolate was still liquid, it was pulling the mold upwards with it as it was warping. And then eventually when it warped too much for the mold and it was solid enough, it would pop off of the mold and continue warping even a little bit more. Um, so having a really robust mold that holds its shape like a professionally made mold is uh, will help with this. Um, in addition, trying to cool your chocolate not quite as quickly if you're seeing a lot of warping uh, can help prevent this. So a lot of people ask me what I use to temper. Um, I use a Revelation 5, Revelation V um, by ChocoVision. It's a tempering machine. Um, they have kind of automatic tempering modes that it comes with. I always put it in manual mode and just set it to my own temperatures based on that tempering curve. Um, it's it's accurate-ish, um, especially, I would say it's, it's within a degree Celsius most of the time, especially if you have more chocolate in it, because as you can see, there's this bowl and then this center part that doesn't move, the bowl rotates. The center part that doesn't move is called the baffle. Um, the temperature sensor is right down here. So the more chocolate you have in it, the more accurate that sensor is because it's surrounded by more chocolate. Um, I like it, it works for me, um, it has given me, now that I've kind of got the process down, good results on temper. Um, I've also got this piece called the skimmer, which is this big up and down piece. And it's kind of a conveyor belt that pulls the chocolate into this spout. And the spout is where I cast from. So I'm gonna show you a video of this working. So the bowl is rotating this whole time. The chocolate goes over the top and then it comes out this spout and kind of a nice pour stream. And then I'm just casting into this little um, syringe type setup. Uh, I've got a lot of bubbles here. I've gotten a lot better since then, but this is what it looked like. Um, this is what it looks like when I use this machine. I always use seated temper. I've done the three-step temper. Uh, for me, it's a little bit more unpredictable, especially because my machine struggles sometimes to get down to that lower temperature. Um, so if you have a similar problem or if you're working in a warmer environment, um, seating can, I think, help. I mean, it, it has made my chocolates go from usually very well-tempered to always very well-tempered. Um, and it is just, I think, a little bit faster and really reliable. Uh, when I'm seeding, um, my kind of motto is uh, seed early, seed often. So as soon as I start cooling, I add in seed crystals and or not seed, I add in little chunks of chocolate, you know, that act as seed crystals. And actually adding in that chocolate, the, the melting process of getting that chocolate from a solid to more of a liquid helps lower the temperature of your chocolate more quickly. So um, I will add seed crystals of chocolate, kind of not quite cover the surface, but just have some all over the surface of my chocolate. Uh, wait until I can't see any more chunks, then add more wait until I can't see any chunks, add more. Uh, once I'm below, uh, I usually don't add any more chocolate below 98 degrees Fahrenheit um, because if you add more after that, it's much more difficult for them to melt. And that means that you're more likely to have little chunks of seed crystal in your final chocolate. But in that time between uh, whatever the upper melting temperature it is uh, to 98 degrees Fahrenheit, I'll seed um, two to four times. So a lot of people ask how the 3D printer maintains temper because they think that we're melting the chocolate inside the printer and they think, oh, well, that must mean that you're destroying the temper. But as you saw from that photo in the beginning of my presentation, the chocolate maintains the temper. It still stays shiny and it still snaps really well. It's got a good kind of crunch when you bite into it. Um, when you bite into really thin layers even. So uh, what we do in the printer to maintain temper is if this is the temper point, we stay right below it. We stay in this dip area and we basically just soften the chocolate without fully melting it so that it can come out of the little nozzle on the printer. Also, 
this, this is the phase diagram that I showed earlier. Uh, you can go up to these higher temperatures as long as you don't go up there for too long and then come back down without destroying the seed crystals, especially because inside the printer, we're not mixing the chocolate. We're just keeping it uh, fairly, I mean, we're pushing it out, but it's not moving very much. So it's less likely to destroy those crystals because that motion helps destroy the crystals. So if there's no motion, the crystals aren't as easily destroyed. That means that when the chocolate comes out the nozzle, it's still got little tiny seed crystals of that beta five that you want. So when it lays down into the final piece, those seed crystals are able to grow and reform the perfectly tempered chocolate. Uh, a little bit about Cocoa Press, what uh, some of the stuff that we make looks like, um, and a little bit about us in general. It's 3D printing with chocolate. So it's got all the same benefits as regular 3D printing. You don't need a mold. Um, you can make shapes that were previously impossible. If you look at these, uh, these are we call them um, texture samples. They've got different fills that you could not make via molding. Um, I mean, maybe if you had the world's most patient and steady handed person with a piping bag, you could make them, but even that the chocolate would solidify in the piping bag too fast. Uh, so you can make all these really cool things and the way this dissolves on your tongue is so interesting and it really changes the flavor of the chocolate. Um, it's temperature controlled at every step. So in the extruder where we're softening the chocolate, it's controlled down to a 10th of a degree Celsius. So you've got really precise control on your chocolate. Um, you have, and then when the chocolate hits the build plate, the whole, it's enclosed in a chamber that is cooled and kept at a lower humidity. So it can solidify fairly quickly so that the next layer can build on top of it. Um, and that chamber is also controlled down to the 10th of a degree Celsius. So uh, you can also have unlimited customization. You could change what you wanna make from part to part. You could print two of, completely opposite things next to each other on the pl build plate out of the same chocolate. Um, and it works with any chocolate because you have that unlimited temperature control, you can set it to whatever you want. You can make names, uh, you can make logos, you can make cake toppers, sculptures. Um, we made this fun little boat. And like I mentioned earlier, you've got these really unique texture samples. Uh, if you're interested in Cocoa Press, uh, check out our website and social media. We're CocoaPress.com, at Cocoa Press on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, and also, we're currently selling customized chocolates, which are these little chocolate bars that we cast. And then uh, we can write whatever message you want on them in white chocolate. So that's kind of fun. Right now, we're only shipping in the United States. But if you're interested in bulk ordering uh, from another country, we can definitely talk about that. Email us. Hello at Cocoa Press is our email. Um, if you're interested in the printer, uh, you can request sample boxes of the chocolate um, and we can work that out with you. Also, uh, we have a chocolate validation process. So if you wanna use your chocolate with the printer, but you wanna make sure that it works before you uh, get more interested in purchasing a printer, then uh, we work out a process where basically you send us a little bit of your chocolate. Uh, we will run some tester batches on it and send you photos and information on the proper temperatures to set it to and kind of the process guidelines so that you can be sure that your chocolate works before you kind of get in um, really deep with that. So yeah, that's my presentation. Um, I've gotten some really great questions as we go along, but um, any further questions, I'm happy to answer, talk some more about anything that you guys are interested in.